In this video, I want to talk about allosteric regulation of the glycolytic enzymes. So we talked about the three enzymes that needed to be allosterically regulated in glycolysis, hexokinase, phosphofructokinase 1, and pyruvate kinase. And the reason why is because all three of those enzymes catalyze irreversible steps, whereas all the other enzymes in glycolysis um, can be used to catalyze the reverse step, which is part of the, the gluconeogenic pathway, which I'll talk about in a later video. So let's let's go through and see what each one of these allosteric effectors is for these different enzymes and kind of if they make sense or not. So hexokinase has one allosteric effector and that's G6P. So high levels of G6P inhibit hexokinase from functioning. Well, hexokinase creates it, what it does is it takes glucose and turns it into G6P. So does it make sense that G6P would inhibit hexokinase? Yeah, it makes sense because G6P is the end product. Right, so essentially, what's going on here is a form of negative feedback. So that negative feedback there, basically, that's just G6P saying, there's plenty of me, don't make more of me. So don't, don't make more if plenty. Okay, that's it for hexokinase. It just has that one allosteric effector, and it's one allosteric effector as an inhibitor. Um, now, phosphofructokinase, we said, was the first committed step, right? Actually, let's write that in red, because that's pretty important. So this is the first committed step, right? So because it's the first committed step, after this, after this step occurs, we've committed to glycolysis. This thing produces F16BP, which is fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. That molecule is committed to the pathway glycolysis. So it's going to be highly regulated, as you can see here. It has a bunch of different allosteric vectors. The first one that we're going to talk about is uh, are the ones that inhibit it. So high levels of ATP inhibit phosphofructokinase. Why would that happen? Well, high levels of ATP, what does that really signal? High levels of ATP indicate um, a high energy state. So basically, if there's a lot of ATP around, that means we have plenty of energy. Phosphofructokinase commits to glycolysis, and one of the products of glycolysis is, is, of course, ATP. So basically, we want to commit to glycolysis when we want to create energy. If there's already plenty of energy around, don't make more. So if we indicate if there's a high energy state, there's plenty of energy, don't make more. So don't make more. So that makes sense, right? There's a high energy state, there's no need to commit to making more energy. No need to commit to, oops, to making more energy. Cool. Now, why would high levels of phosphoenopyruvate or PEP inhibit phosphofructokinase? Well, PEP. Um, comes later in the in the pathway of glycolysis, and basically, if there's a lot of if there's a buildup of it, that probably means that the step that goes from PEP to pyru to via pyruvate kinase to pyruvate uh, is not happening. And if that's not happening, we don't want to keep creating PEP. So basically, PEP, uh, if it builds up, it'll tell phosphofructokinase, "Don't make more of me." Okay, so it's telling phosphofructokinase, "Stop creating me." There's plenty of me already around, right? So it's sort of the same reason as, as we mentioned here. There's no need to make more of plenty. Now there are a few things that activate phosphofructokinase one, the the committed step of glycolysis. So um, phosphofructokinase is activated by high levels of ADP and high levels of AMP. Now both of these things, you can kind of imagine when does ADP come into play? ADP results after we've used up ATP and AMP could even result that of that same way. In any case, um, high levels of ADP and AMP, they kind of do the opposite of high levels of ATP. They indicate low energy states. So if they indicate low energy states, then we want to commit to making more energy. So if we have low energy, those a lot of those low energy a lot of those indicators of low energy, then we want to make sure that those things activate the production of more energy. Phosphofructokinase commits to making more energy, so it makes sense that these, these indicators of low energy would um, 
would want us to commit to making more. So commit to making more energy. This last thing here, high levels of fructose 2,6 bisphosphate or F2,6 BP um, also activate phosphofructokinase 1. This one's a little bit fishy, a little bit tough to understand. And um, if you recall, some of you may have seen that other video that I made. It was a bit complex, so I wanted to simplify things here. Um, fructose 2,6 bisphosphate is made by phosphofructokinase 2, right? Phosphofructokinase 1 makes fructose 1,6 bisphosphate. The thing, the molecule that's committed to glycolysis, fructose 26 bisphosphate is made by PFK2. Now that thing, as I mentioned in that other video, if you saw it, um, is hormonally controlled. So the hormones that control it um, are uh, insulin and glucagon, um, which we'll talk more about later uh, in future videos. But I don't want to dwell too much on that right now. Instead. The reasoning behind this, just kind of keep it at this simple idea that a lot of this being around, this is an indicator of, uh, this indicates a high glucose availability. So if there's a bunch of glucose av available, we want to decrease that amount of glucose, right? So we have a, a large concentration of glucose, large glucose availability then we want to break that glucose down or reduce that amount okay so we reduce that amount lower that amount um, that glucose concentration by by um, activating glycolysis right and specifically by activating the committed step of glycolysis right phosphofructokinase 1 Okay, so that's essentially what's going on there. So if there's a high amount of fructose 26 bisphosphate that indicates a high amount of glucose available. If there's a high amount of glucose available, we want to lower it. So we're going to lower that glucose amount by activating glycolysis, breaking it down to pyruvate. So we want to commit to that pathway. Okay, and again, uh, let me mention here just just briefly the hormones that that are actually control it are glucagon and insulin and Glucagon is the hormone that increases blood glucose levels, whereas uh, insulin is the one that decreases blood glucose levels. So between these two, which one would activate PFK2? Um, glucagon is the thing that increases blood glucose levels. Here we're trying to decrease blood glucose levels, so this one would deactivate PFK2, whereas insulin would activate PFK2 because it's the one that wants to decrease the blood glucose level. So insulin would play a role in in um, activating glycolysis, sort of through this mechanism. Okay, this this bit isn't all too crazy important um, for this explanation as long as you understand that the high levels of fructose 26 bisphosphate indicate this high amount of glucose, and we want to lower that, so we'll activate glycolysis by activating the committed step. Okay, so now let's get into pyruvate kinase. Um, so pyruvate kinase has three different allosteric inhibitors. Um, those are high levels of ATP. So high levels of ATP, um, what I'm going to write here is just really just the same as above, right? Same as above. And what I mean by that is that if there's plenty, it indicates plenty of energy. If there's plenty of energy around, there's no need to keep creating more. This pyruvate kinase step makes that last bit of ATP. We don't want that to be active if we, if we already have plenty of ATP around. So now let's mention uh, acetyl-CoA. Why would a lot of acetyl-CoA um, inhibit pyruvate kinase? Well, um, if there's a lot of acetyl-CoA, this is also an indicator of having plenty of energy. Um, so I'm going to actually write that here. Also indicates plenty of energy. But... Um, which which would you know sort of lead into why we'd have to stop glycolysis right inhibit glycolysis um, in addition if there's a bunch of acetyl CoA that probably means that the TCA cycle which actually uses up acetyl CoA and breaks it down to create a bunch of NADHs for the electron transport chain is backed up it's also so it also indicates the plenty of energy but so that's like the first thing that it does or one, or one of the things that it does the second thing is that it also indicates the TCA is backed up 
to some extent, right? That these these acetyl CoA's are not being used up. So there's no sense in creating more pyruvate, which might actually be turned into acetyl CoA if there's already plenty of acetyl CoA around, right? So this is also why we would want to stop creating pyruvate because that pyruvate is often going to turn into acetyl CoA. It's a little bit fishy now, but it'll sort of make more sense later, hopefully. So uh, what about high amounts of alanine? If you recall, alanine is um, an amino acid. Um, it's actually a derivative of pyruvate. Okay, so um, this is a derivative of pyruvate, and I'll kind of show you guys how that the how that is in just a second. So it's a derivative of pyruvate. So it indicates high levels of pyruvate, right? If there's high levels of pyruvate, there's no sense in making more, right? So if there's a high level of pyruvate, don't make more. So how does that even make sense? Well, let's think about this. Uh, what do we know alanine to look like? It looks like an amino acid. It has this um, carboxyl group here, this hydrogen here, an amino group here, and a CH3 here. Well, how does pyruvate look? Pyruvate looks like this. And that's how pyruvate looks. So this is alanine, and this is pyruvate. They look very, very similar. The only difference here is this alpha carbon. Has a, this alpha carbon and alanine has the amino group and the hydrogen, whereas in pyruvate we just have that um, that ketone, that carbonyl group there. So that's, they're they're very very similar in structure. So if there's a lot of alanine around, that indicates high levels of pyruvate, which we want to inhibit the production of more pyruvate. Last bit here, this active this uh, fructose one six bisphosphate, high levels of that activate pyruvate kinase. This essentially means, if there's a lot of this around, this means that the committed step is, is, is very being very productive. So this means the committed step, committed step, right, the PFK step, is being very productive, right? So we're committing to glycolysis a great deal. What we don't want, we don't want to get to to phosphoenol pyruvate and then get to this pyruvate kinase step and have it not be able to, to go through. If we're committing to glycolysis, we want to make sure that we finish glycolysis. So um, it would make sense then that high levels of, of the committed uh, molecule would activate the completion of glycolysis. Okay. So I hope that was helpful in clearing things up as far as allosteric regulation of uh, glycolysis. See you in the next video.